Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on overcoming imposter syndrome in our classrooms. Our presenter today is Rachel Gallardo of Blinn College. My name is Sidra, and I'm your moderator for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A module as we go, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Thank you so very much, and happy Monday, everybody. I'm very excited to have you guys with me, so let me make sure I push all of the buttons so that way we can um, see what we need to see for today. Okay, so like Sidra said, my name is Rachel Gallardo, and um, I am actually the department chair at Blinn College in psychology and anthropology. And part of the reason why this whole idea of imposter syndrome became such a passion of mine is because I do work with a number of students in our student population that are first-generation college students. And having been a first-generation college student myself, I can truly understand what many of them are dealing with. Um, where they're coming from, and just kind of some of that that self doubt that that comes up from time to time whenever you're trying to go to class and you're trying to um, accomplish these things, and yet it seems like there's something mentally that continues to go on. So my background is in industrial organizational psychology, and I I tend to look at workplace burnout and um, fatigue that happens in the work environment. And so the more I started looking into this information and how it pertains to the students, the more I started to realize, oh. This is actually going on with many of the of the faculty as well, many of the employees, um, uh, not just maybe at our college, but in, in schools, college, K through 12, across the whole gambit. So um, I'm really excited to be able to present what I have found today, and hopefully you can take this information back to your corners of the world to help um, maybe yourself, maybe help your students, help your colleagues, and just make things better as a whole. So just to kind of give you a lay of the land of what to expect over the next hour, um, we're going to have a little bit of a truth session. So we're going to talk about a couple of things and just kind of come to terms with where we're at mentally. Then I'll give you some of the technical stuff as far as what is imposter syndrome, um, what is some of the data behind imposter syndrome. Um, we'll go over a couple of pointers as far as how we can overcome it, and we'll actually have an opportunity to practice some of this as well. Later on in the presentation, um, Sidra is going to be so kind as to post a PDF document that you'll be able to use and download and, and take and use for yourself, and so hopefully that will help enforce some of these learning ideas that we're talking about today. So first and foremost, I believe in honesty. Um, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown, as I'm sure many of you are as well, and she really talks about being authentic and transparent. And so I think before we can really get into conversation about what this um, imposter syndrome really is, we've got to be honest with ourselves and kind of recognize what's going on. So feel free to drop this into the chat or if you want to raise your hand or however you want to, to signal it, but um, type yes in the chat if you are or were the first in your family to go to college. And since I'm doing it here on the screen, I'm just going to go ahead and raise my hand. Okay, got a few people, some information coming in. Okay. Type yes in the chat if you sometimes feel uncomfortable in your own skin. Well, whew, I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand on that one too. Yep, got a couple of other people. Oh, we got a yes in there. So, uh-huh. Okay, good. So I'm I'm in the I'm with the right crowd. I'm excited about this. Um, type yes in the chat if you feel like there is so much about this world that you don't know or understand. That's that's a big fat yes right there. There's plenty of things that come across in our newsfeed, um, on social media, things that we hear and see other people out in our world doing, and you're just like, why? What? What? Why did you think that that would be okay? Right. Couple more. Um, type yes in the chat if you have ever failed. So this is, you know, two hands. If I could, you know, grow a third hand, I'd put that up for sure. So a couple of other people agreeing with me. And then finally, type yet type yes in the chat if you have ever made a mistake. Again, I need three, four, five, ninety thousand hands at that point, right? So basically, we can all pretty much agree that there's a lot of things that we, we're not sure about, that, um, that, that we're missing information from, and that we have failed because we've tried to navigate it and figure things out on our own. And first and foremost, I just want to congratulate you for being a human being on planet Earth. Um, I don't think we get enough credit for the fact that we are humans on planet Earth, planet Earth kind of navigating all of these challenges. 
but I really and truly do appreciate your transparency. Um, that does take a lot of courage to be able to admit certain things. And some people um, that really struggle with perfectionism, they have a really hard time admitting whenever they have failed or maybe not done as well as they've wanted to, especially in a public setting. So I'm gonna pause for about 15 seconds because there's a lot of information on the slide and then we'll talk through what these items mean. Okay, so when we look at imposter syndrome, basically the, the basic definition and kind of the, the common landing point for the definition for this term is that a person experiences feelings of inadequacy despite having tremendous success. Um, and even, I should probably rephrase that, may not necessarily even be tremendous, but they've made success. They've, they've done things that they, they, they didn't think that they were capable of doing. They've been able to overcome certain obstacles. They've been able to overcome certain barriers. And no matter what, it's still that feeling of, I'm not enough, or I didn't do this well enough. I didn't um, prepare for this adequately enough. And it, it can be really paralyzing. It can be really crippling because if you are capable of doing things and you're capable of being successful, but yet between your two ears, you're still putting yourself down, um, that's gonna eventually lead to a negative mindset, which in turn can possibly lead to high anxiety, depression, and things of that nature. Um, these individuals, they are not able to internalize accomplishments no matter how successful they are. Um, so even if they do receive an accomplishment, if they receive some sort of a, an award for, for obtaining a goal, they'll brush it off as being no big deal or, um, well, you know, it, I had other people that helped me or, and it, it's not just about being humble. It's not just about humility. These individuals will literally not take credit for having done anything, despite the fact that they were a part of being successful. And if you really dig into the data, you dig into the research, it shows that there are three very common areas where you'll find this mindset of imposter syndrome the most. So individuals that struggle with perfectionism is the number one place where you'll find imposter syndrome kind of, kind of sprouting from, from the seeds of this. Um, these individuals are very concerned about making sure that everything is just so. I can't let you see any kind of gaps in the armor. I can't let you see any part of me that is not exactly how I want it to be. Um, they're very careful about how they present themselves. They're very careful about what they say and how they act and how they dress. And so um, just trying to make sure that I keep all of the balls in the air because I can't let you see what's what's going on behind the curtain. I can't I, I can't be vulnerable to you in that way for whatever the reason might be. Um, another common demographic that that struggles with imposter syndrome the most are women. So women tend to um, have these different thoughts. They where women are more inclined to compare themselves to other people. Um, so, you know, Susie Q over here, she's got it all together. Her kids are this, her husband is this, her, her job is this, not knowing that maybe Susie Q is struggling with these issues of perfectionism and is likely dealing with imposter syndrome the same way that her counterpart woman is, right? Um, also, imposter syndrome out of all of the other industries is most prevalent in academics. And this is including college, but it also includes K through 12. So if you are standing on a platform teaching a student in any capacity, you are at an increased chance of falling into this bracket where you might be dealing with imposter syndrome. Now, one thing I want to make very, very clear, imposter syndrome is not in the DSM. So the diagnostic manual that psychologists use for diagnosis of, of mental health issues, imposter syndrome is not in the DSM. However, it is common enough and it is prevalent enough, and there's an ongoing amount of research that's coming to fruition where we do still need to discuss it. Um, the field of psychology is due for a new DSM, so if it'll be in there, I really don't know. If somebody else knows, feel free to, to let the rest of us know. But as it is right now, you won't find anything about this in the DSM, but it's still something that impacts people mentally, so that's why I'm thankful we're able to talk about it. So how can you tell if a student of yours may be dealing with imposter syndrome? So first and foremost, these thoughts are gonna carry on for an extended period of time. So for me in particular, in my world, midterms are about two weeks away. 
And so I'm sure that there's some students that are kind of starting to get that antsiness, like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not sure if I can do this. But then spring break is right after that week. And then some of most of them, those thoughts will subside and, and they'll be just fine. So when we talk about an extended period of time, we're talking about the individual having these negative thoughts about themselves for four, five, six months. So this is not just, I'm having a really bad week. This is, I'm having a really bad half of 2023. And that's why um, this person might be dealing with things of imposter syndrome. Um, if this individual is dealing with imposter syndrome, you might notice that the way that they're working is an indication that they have these thoughts going on. So typically very, very anxious, but having a really hard time focusing because they're so busy trying to make sure that nothing falters that they're not able to pay attention. Um, have you ever had that situation where you had so many things to do that you just, you didn't even know where to start? You're just like, well, okay, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Take that and magnify it by three or four months. That's the mindset that these individuals are in. Um, they're also comparing themselves to other people. And oftentimes they may even be comparing themselves vocally to somebody else. Well, I'm not as smart as the other students in the class. Um, I'm not as capable as the other students in the class. Well, they are able to go to the, the, the learning center, but I'm not able to go to the learning center because I have to take care of my family, et cetera, et cetera. So when they're, they're vocalizing these things and, and constantly comparing themselves to other people, and you can clearly tell that they're, they're either really anxious or they're just kind of feeling stuck, then those might be some signs that you have a student in your class that is dealing with imposter syndrome. And then also too, there are some physical ailments that we can be mindful of. So there's a really, really strong connection between what goes on in our thoughts and then what actually plays out in our bodies from a physiological perspective. So somebody that's dealing with imposter syndrome, they may have really intense, frequent headaches. Um, if it's not dealt with, they may even, that might even trigger some migraines just because of how much pressure and stress they're placing on themselves. Um, they may say that they have some sort of stomach aches. Um, and so maybe there's some cramping going on, some gas going on, that sort of thing. And then there could also be the situation where they're either overeating or they're not eating at all. So take note of some of those body symptoms. If somebody is continually saying, yeah, you know, I just, I have a headache and my stomach's really bothering me and you know, I'm not really hungry. I really haven't eaten anything in the last couple of weeks. Not necessarily saying that it's imposter syndrome, but as an instructor looking at students, it's something to just kind of keep in mind. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about the field that I'm in is that it's all about just studying and watching people. And human beings, we have patterns, we have behaviors, we have things about us that just simply don't change. And if you happen to notice that there's a change in your students, or a change in a fellow colleague, then there may be something else going on. And then you, you know, depending upon your relationship with that person, you might feel comfortable talking to them or at least just letting them know that you care. Some common thoughts that people with imposter syndrome might have bouncing around in their head. Um, I'm dumb. That is absolutely one of the things that my students are not allowed to say to themselves in my presence. And in fact, whenever I do have a student that says, oh, I'm just dumb, I'll, I'll look them straight in the eye and say, you know what, don't talk about my student that way. And the, because that negative, that negative record player that we play over and over and over again in our minds will permeate. And we don't want it to, we don't want for the student to keep playing that record. We want them to change the record to something more positive and um, more helpful. Um, there could be those thoughts of, there's no way that I can do this. I just don't know if I'm capable of learning all this information. Um, some of the students might have that added pressure of, I can't fail. I, I just, I can't fail. I really can't fail for whatever reason they believe. Some of them might think, well, you know, it's really all about luck. It really doesn't matter how hard you try. You know, you just, you got to get lucky sometimes in this world if you're going to get by. Um, again, they might brush off any sort of an accomplishment. So, oh, that, that thing, oh, it's no big deal. You know, it, it's fine. And then the last one, which I think is probably the saddest, is that simple, I just don't belong here with these people. Um, and for people that are first-generation college students, they could have a lot of pressures outside of the classroom. They could very well have friends or family members or, or other people in their life that are telling them, I don't know why you're wasting your time going to school, like there's really no point. Um, if you're a coach and you're you know, coaching athletes, 
they might feel that they're not strong enough, fast enough, capable enough, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of all of that, those negative thoughts just really start to weigh down. And um, you know, having a relationship with our students can be really beneficial because if we hear these phrases, again, I'm not 100% saying that it's imposter syndrome because you can never be 100% about anything, but at least if you hear some of these phrases, maybe it'll trigger you to think that maybe your student is feeling this way. So that way you can help kind of reshape their thought process and guide them in a different direction. So from a workplace perspective, let me just give you a couple of stats. Um, currently, there are 33% of Americans that are dealing with imposter syndrome right now. So at any given point, you've got a third of our population that is uh, that is currently having and wrestling with these negative thoughts over and over and over again. Um, the predominant number of or age group of these individuals that are dealing with imposter syndrome, you've got 46% of them between the ages of 18 to 24 years of age. And where I work, our student body population is between the ages of 18 till about 22. So it would it make sense that um, many of them might be dealing with this imposter syndrome. 35% um, of women are currently dealing with this issue. 30% of men are currently dealing with this issue. But for me, the number that was really astounding is this one to discuss is academia. 82% of people currently working in academia are currently right now at this very moment dealing with imposter syndromes in their mind. 82%. So that's that's a really big that's a really big number. It's a really big number. Um but let's talk about our students. So we said kind of America as a whole does anybody want to take a guess on the stats for our students? So what are the current percentage of students that are working around, walking around dealing with imposter syndrome right now? Okay, we got 76%, majority, higher than 33. First general, 78, 66. So actually, you guys, it's a little bit higher than you might think, but it's still enough that's somewhat concerning. So 20%. 20% of college students right now are currently dealing with some form of imposter syndrome. Now, granted, there's there's varying degrees of this, so depending upon how intense their, their thoughts are, um, it might change just a little bit, but still, 20%. So if you're looking at a class of 30, that still means that there are six students sitting in your class that are currently having feelings of, I don't belong here. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm never going to overcome this. I'm never going to be able to get through it. And for me, whenever I look at 20%, I automatically go into letter grades. Um, so, I mean, 20%, okay, automatically from 100, then that's a B. That's the highest that somebody can get is a B. But 20%, six students in my class are currently dealing with this right now. And for me, I want to make sure that I, I can identify who those six are so I can work with them and I can help them see that they do belong in my class and that they are capable of being successful. So when we talk about specifically with first generation college students, first and foremost, there is a lot of self-doubt. So there's a lot of feelings of, can I do this? Am I smart enough? Am I capable enough? How am I going to pay for this? Um, it, uh, you know, hopefully I can I can get this degree so that way I can get I can get the job. Um, so there's a lot of self doubt that a lot of imposter that a lot of first generation college students really wrestle with on a regular basis. Added to that, many first generation college students report feeling a lot of guilt for going to school um, because maybe they've had family members that have said that well you know you're you're leaving us and we're not going to have anybody to take care of your younger brother or sister and. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of family dynamics that might be in play for students that are first generation college students. And the fact of the matter is they many of them don't know all of the resources that are available to them that, um, you know, if they are dealing with some of that self doubt of if they belong in the school, you know, maybe maybe they're not fully aware of the, the disability services center or the mental health clinic that's available or if there's a food pantry so some of some of the students might be dealing with food shortages. Um, and just not knowing that, but then also getting some of that guilt externally can be can increase the chances of this person feeling this imposter syndrome. And then also, too, it's that whole idea of fear. 
you know, I'm, I'm taking a step out in the direction that I feel that I should be going. I'm going to school, but what if I fail? What if everything everybody told me is true and I really don't belong here and then I've got to go back to whatever town it is that I came from and confront all of these people. All of that is just going to increase the chances of this person feeling imposter syndrome. And the interesting thing about it is if 82% of people working in academics are feeling this, well, the teachers, K through 12, through um, college, I mean, all of us, we're all there. So there's 80 plus percent of us that are feeling imposter syndrome. And then from an academic standpoint, the students are also in academia. So here we've got a whole hodgepodge of people that are walking around with feeling these feelings of anxiety and and. Um, and feeling imposter syndrome, feeling like they don't belong, feeling like they have to, you know, fix, manage, and control every little thing from a perfectionist standpoint. And we're all in the same boat, you know? And so the more that we as in instructors can tell our students that, oh yeah, I felt that before. Oh yeah, I've experienced that before. First day of class, one of the things that I do is I tell my students, yeah, I'm a first-generation college student. Let me tell you about my background. Came from a single parent home. I went to college in another, another state. I had to figure everything out by myself. Parents were too broke to be able to send me any sort of money. So I had to work two jobs and, you know, I had a little brother that I felt guilty for leaving behind. And so just kind of laying all my cards out there on the table, immediately it breaks down those walls with my students. And so whenever issues come up, many of them do feel comfortable coming to me because they know that I get it. Um, and even those students that aren't first generation college students, they still see me as, oh, okay, here's a, here's a human being that, that can help me and, and um, can show me, give me some resources that I need to be successful. But ultimately just letting them know that they're not alone and that they don't have to progress through course to course to course by themselves. Um, for those of you that are teaching high school, middle school, even elementary, some of the students might feel very isolated um, isolation is a terrible thief of joy. It gets you locked into your own head. And whenever you don't make those connections with other people, it can be really hard to find the motivation to keep going. So, oh, I threw this in here because if you do have somebody that says, oh, I've never at all, ever, ever, ever felt this, not even one day, it's my little, it's my little potent Okio thing. I'm always a little reluctant whenever somebody says that they never felt that way. But if you do have a student that you think might be experiencing these things, or if you have a fellow colleague or even yourself, if you feel like you're kind of in this headspace right now, then that's what we're gonna spend the latter part of our presentation today talking about. So it is time for a change. Um, Sidra, if you can post the PDF document for everyone. I sure can, give me one quick second. Thank you so much. So in just a minute, we're going to use this document, but I want to give you guys some time to kind of go ahead and download that to your devices so that way you can kind of start looking at a few things. But whenever we deal with this idea of imposter syndrome, whenever we're, we're going to tackle changing our thoughts and changing our approach to how we're thinking, there's five different things that we're going to focus on. So first and foremost, reshape your thoughts. Um, I'm always, my husband kind of criticizes me because not criticized, but he pokes fun at me um, because I tend to always look at things in a positive way. And it's not that I'm a Pollyanna of the world and I don't think that there are bad things out there and that I'm not realistic because I am. I just choose to try to find the good no matter what situation may have occurred. And so if we can help our students with that, um, then that can be really beneficial. So for example, if I have a student that comes to me and says, well, you know what, I did not do good on your first test and I'm really kind of stressing and, and I don't know how I'm going to be able to finish in your class. The first thing I tell them, is like, okay, well, cool. At least you've identified that you didn't do well on, your, on the first test. And this is your opportunity to do something different. And then we talk about study skills and we talk about you know, memory, and we talk about scaffolding, and we talk about, you know, well, I don't mention Bloom's taxonomy, but basically when I'm presenting information to them, I'm kind of getting them to think a little bit deeper about the topic instead of just the basic vocabulary stuff. And then in doing that, inevitably, after the second test, I look at their grade and I'm like, oh, look at that, you did tremendously better. But I really believe that's because we, you know, we spend the time rethinking about the problem instead of, okay, this bad thing happened to me and now I'm going to be crippled from it. So reshape your thoughts. That can be, that can be step number one. The second thing to think about is to reframe failure as a learning opportunity. 
So going back to my example of my student who maybe failed a test, this is my opportunity to show them how they can learn differently. Um, a lot of students don't really know how to study and they're not sure how to prepare. If you're a first generation college student, you may not know who to go to talk to about time management or um, you know, interpersonal relationships. And um, you know, particularly at, at the age group that I'm teaching, many of them, it's the first time away from home. They have a whole lot of free time. And so when they tell me, I just, I just don't have the time to study. We sit down and we kind of look at their week and I ask for them to block out their time. Like, let, let's take a look at what you do all day for the 24 hour period, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time they sit and they color in all of their times, this includes sleeping, eating, going to work, sitting in class, they can visually see, oh, I have a lot more time available than I realized. And so I'm able to kind of reshape their thinking about time and get them to see, well, look, you know, you only have 30 minutes, but do you know how much you can accomplish in 30 minutes? Let's talk about all the things that you can do to learn this particular area in my class in 30 minutes. And little by little, they come back and they tell me, oh, I was able to apply that to my other classes. And so here we go. We've created a snowball effect. Um, I try to empower them to be, to own their own learning. And oftentimes they end up doing just fine. A third thing to think about when we're looking to take on imposter syndrome is to seek support. And I think this is pretty commonplace as far as what we tell students to do, you know, join a club or go to the learning disability services, go talk to a counselor, um, reach out to somebody in your class, join a cohort, get on Google, um, the, the um, texting app or whatever, and, and work together. But I think that this is really important from a teaching standpoint as well. Um, teaching, in my experience, it can be a very isolating practice because you're in a classroom with your students, and then in the free time that you have, you're either grading papers or you're prepping for the next class. And so that doesn't really give you a whole lot of time to have some of those conversations or the interpersonal relationships with other people. Um, and then there's meetings to go to, there's committees that you're on. And so it, it, it can really be kind of isolating. If you find yourself kind of in this, this headspace where you, you feel disconnected from other people, I would encourage you to reach out to somebody that you trust and say, look, you know, I'm really kind of struggling with this right now. Is there anything that maybe you can help me with? Um, as somebody that likes to do things on my own, I, I struggle a lot with asking for help, but this is an area that I'm improving in and I'm sure that many of you want to improve in as well. And little by little, if we continue to ask for support, eventually we get it and we can kind of balance out our responsibilities and we're not so by ourselves anymore whenever we're dealing with situations in our classroom or um, with the school as a whole. And then another thing we can encourage our students to do is to visualize their success. Um, and this is true for, for instructors as well. So when I was in middle school, my, um, my basketball coach, he would always encourage us before we were to take our free throws that we were to stop and visually picture our ball going into the basket. And that's something that always really kind of stuck with me. And so if we can take the time to have our students just kind of do even just a 60 second, you know, close your eyes, think about where you wanna be in five years. What does your house look like? What does your car look like? Do you have a dog or a cat? Who's the person standing next to you? What job are you getting ready to go do? And just, you know, just a small close your eyes, 60 second, asking them questions and giving them a chance to kind of visualize what's going on. When you do that, you pull them out of the situation they're currently in and you get them to focus on the big picture. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have some assignments in my class that when you look at all of the grades as a whole is worth maybe a point, point and a half but I will have some students that will stress so much over that one assignment that I finally have to break it down to them and say, I need for you to focus on the exam that's worth 10% of your grade, not this one assignment that's worth a point. And so getting them to see kind of the big picture and helping them to visualize where it is that they're trying to get to you after long, long, you know, after they get out of our courses can be really valuable. I would encourage you as instructors and, and reminder for myself as well to do the same thing. You know, where, where do I see myself in five years? And is this thing that I'm, I'm stressing over that I'm, I'm just spending so much time perfecting, is it really going to help me get where I need to be in the next five years? 
If the answer to that is no, then why am I stressing over it so much, right? So just keep those things in mind whenever you're, you're thinking about it from a student standpoint and your own. And then finally, be kind to yourself. Um, I know that many of us are very good about being kind to other people. You know, we hold the door open when we're at the grocery store. If we see somebody wearing something really cute, then, you know, we might we might compliment them on it. Um, you know, have that small talk there by the coffee pot, you know, and we're, we're super nice to everybody else. But I really truly believe that you can't give to others what you don't first have within yourself. And so while we might be able to be kind to a certain extent, if we start with being kind to ourselves, I really believe that we can then extend that kindness out further. So, you know, don't, don't call yourself a dummy. Don't say that you don't belong. Like really stop and ask yourself, what is the record that's playing in my mind? And if you change the record, you'll then be able to, to push that kindness out to so many other people and to help more people than you realize. So we've talked a lot about theory and I've spent a lot of time kind of explaining some of the, the scientific, the research information that goes along with this. But here's where that PDF that was posted in the chat, that's where this is gonna come into play. So we've talked about theory, now it's time to actually put some of this into practice. And from a psychological standpoint, there are three main things that we look at whenever we're looking at an individual. First, we wanna to try to understand their thoughts. We wanna to try to understand their emotions. And the third thing that we wanna to try to understand is their behavior. So whenever you go to try and implement change, you wanna start, well, maybe not necessarily start, but for our purposes today, we're gonna to start with our thoughts, then we're gonna to go to our emotions, then we're gonna to go to behavior. So on one of the sheets, and I believe it's the second page in that PDF document, you should see something at the top of the page that says a walk down memory lane. And so whenever you look at the walk down memory lane, this is just a very simple exercise. You can give this to your students. You can do this for yourself. You can give it to your fellow colleagues, but it forces you to take a look at what happened to you in your past. Um, what did you accomplish in your past? And what, how did that accomplishment make you feel? Because too, too many times we forget about those things very easily. And the beautiful thing about this particular handout is that it can be on an individual basis or it could be on a team basis. So if you've got students that are in band, basketball, football, tennis, golf, whatever, um, they can go through these particular questions and really stop and remember, okay, I remember my thought process whenever I was faced with that really difficult task. And I remember doing that really difficult task in a very scary mindset. But you know what? I came out on the other side and here are the things that I learned. Here's how I felt. And so if I'm able to accomplish that, I can accomplish this. I don't know about you guys, but when COVID came through in 2020, whew, I was, it was rough, you know, because not only making sure that my students were taken care of in my class, but then also making sure that my faculty were taken care of and that they felt supportive. And now that I'm on kind of the back end of COVID, I don't know if there's really anything that I'm afraid of now from an education standpoint. I mean, if I'm able to go through all of those things that I went through in 2020 and 2021, I'm not really afraid of pretty much anything in the future from a from a academic and from a teaching standpoint, you know? So take some time to, to go through that. Again, this is something that your students can use. I have my students do this, you know, usually around this time of the semester, just because I can tell that they're getting into that lull. And hopefully it, it rejuvenates them and, and gets them to realize that um, you are going to get through this. You know, this too shall pass. We just have to keep doing what we know to do and eventually everything will work out. The second aspect that we're going to look at is from an emotional perspective. So the first page in that PDF document, there's a column for a fixed mindset and there's a column for a growth mindset. And the reason why I have students kind of come up with their own ideas um, for a fixed and growth mindset is because I want for them to understand the language. I want for them to, to kind of feel the emotion of the words that they're saying whenever they're, they're talking in a fixed mindset perspective versus when they're talking in a growth mindset perspective. And there's some examples that are listed there at the top of the table. And then there's some blank spaces there for, um, you know, for students to fill out their own. But then I encourage students to kind of keep that piece of paper handy. 
And that way, if they they feel like they're they're going down the wrong direction, at least they've got those growth mindset comments that they can read over to kind of help reshape and um, redirect their thought process. You know, the neural channels that we have in our brains are very, very much ingrained. And the older we get, the more ingrained they get. So we have to do everything we can to try to make sure that those neural channels are going to be um, more in a positive perspective. And it is possible for us to change. We just have to be willing to do the work to have that change occur. And doing something as simple as the six mindset versus growth mindset um, exercise can help reshape some of those neural channels so that way we're more effective as a whole. So a few more things to think about. Um, imposter syndrome, while we've talked a lot about how it makes you feel negative and is maybe not always the best thing, there are some benefits to having imposter syndrome. So if you're currently experiencing this right now, or if you know that you have students that are experiencing this right now, feel free to remind them of the, these three things or to remind yourself of these three things. So number one, it does make you try harder. So when you're in that imposter syndrome mindset, you're so concerned about making sure that everything is just so that you are working harder. Um, now, I don't recommend anybody do that for a long period of time. Burnout is very real. Once a person reaches burnout, it is not reversible. So I don't want anybody burning out. But it does make you try just a little bit harder. It does make you prepare just a little bit more. And to the point of the second bullet, it does encourage problem solving a little bit. So if this thing that I'm trying to accomplish, if the first way that I tried to do it didn't work, okay, what are some other ways that I can that I can implement to make sure that what I want to accomplish is actually accomplished? So it makes you try harder. It makes you go through some of those problem solving steps to, to rethink through possible solutions to whatever you're dealing with. And all of that is just an indication that you are in fact challenging yourself. You're not comfortable with the status quo. You want to be innovative. You want to be more engaging. You want to learn more things. And I don't know a teacher in the world that's going to say, ah, you don't need to learn anything else, right? So it does help us to challenge ourselves just a little bit more. But like everything in life, there's got to be a balance. And so we've got to make sure that there's some sort of balance going on and having that growth mindset exercise and reframing the problem and things like that can help make sure we have that balance. But remember how I said, that we talk about thoughts, emotions, and behavior. So the last one is the actual physical body and what our bodies are physically doing to, to help reshape our thought process. So we've already kind of thought about the past and we've invoked those words from an emotional standpoint to get us on track. Now there just becomes a, a behavior situation. And so I, it seems really corny. And if you're at your desk and you wanna do this, then you know what, go for it. I'm never gonna tell somebody not to, but, um, there, our body really has an impact over our minds and our minds has an impact on our, our body. If we're constantly walking around with many of my students, I don't know about you guys, but many of them, their shoulders are hunched and they're looking down and they're constantly looking at their phones. You're, you're sending a signal to your brain about being closed in, about being um, withdrawn from everyone. But if you put your head up and you put your shoulders back and I actually have my students stand up and put their hands on their hips, I call it the superhero pose immediately you, you're you sending a different signal to your brain that I'm going to approach the situation differently. I'm standing confidently. I've got my, my shoulders back and my hands are on my hips. And inevitably, my students laugh, which is my trick to release dopamine and serotonin into their brains. So any kind of, you know, laughter, you know, positive-based emotions, even something as simple as, come on, pick your, your favorite superhero and give me a pose and I've got some that will like go full on, you know, this and Batman and everything else. That's fine. I've just told your brain to give you some serotonin to make you feel better, which ultimately also helps with imposter syndrome. So maybe encourage your students to do a little superhero pose, or maybe you can do a superhero pose. I, I like, I'm going to tell myself that a couple of you did it at your desk while I was talking. And so I'm just going to believe that you did that. And that made me happy. So if anybody has any questions about this, you know, I, I'm super compassionate about and just have a real strong passion for workplace burnout, especially whenever it comes to education. There's various things on here. If you want a copy of the slides, feel free to send me an email. I had a couple people that reached out earlier this morning. I'm going to send them my slides. If you want these, you're more than welcome to have them. Just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to give those over to you. Um, and then because it is education, throw out my references. But um, ultimately, that's all I, I have. And so 
I want to say thank you very much for um, listening. And if there are any questions, we'll go ahead and um, discuss those if there's any out there. Awesome. Thank you. We do have one question so far. Um, one, if you can show the QR code again so they sure. can scan it. And then um, you mentioned 20% of college student experience is this um, imposter syndrome. Do you know if that's looking at only first generation cohort uh, that is higher or was that stat FG only? I don't know if it was first generation students only. Um, the research was actually kind of vague about it. It just said college students. Um, so I can't, I don't know that any more specifics of it beyond that. Okay. Um, and then there was another question. Give me one second. Do you have this source for uh, where that data was collected for the 20%? I do. Yep. So on my... There's a number of references here. So um, in fact, here's the study from right here. 20% of college students experience imposter syndrome. So it's this very last one down here where that data came from. But feel free to take a picture. And again, if anybody wants a copy of these slides, I'm happy to email those out and you guys can, can look at the information too. I appreciate that. Is there any correlation between imposter syndrome and fear of success, or are they different concepts? Um, I think that those would be different concepts. So imposter syndrome, you don't feel like you're good enough and that you kind of dismiss away any sort of accomplishments, whereas fear of success is more of if I do this one really great thing, bad things will happen to me. And for and th those are two very different dynamics. They're they're very close cousins to each other. Um, and I, I I I'm I actually have one student in particular that said that she was afraid of being successful. Um, but yeah, those those would be two different things. Good question though. Awesome. If or sorry, how if at all does imposter syndrome play a role in plagiarism, and what can teachers do to address it? Oh man, so that is at the heart of something that I am really looking into this semester um, with the whole chat GPT and things like that. I think that there are a number of students that are terrified of writing and um, maybe they don't, or I should rephrase that. I think some are terrified of writing. I think some don't know how to write. I think some are just not confident in their own writing abilities. And so they lean on those AI programs to generate all or some of the, the content. Um, I, I don't think that AI is going away, but I think that something that I'm looking at in my classes in the future is finding a way to incorporate the AI technology. Um, I know that at least the presentation that I was a part of um, about either last week or two weeks ago, they said that Turnitin is currently working on being able to identify what percentage of the paper is human and what percentage of the paper is um, a robot. And so there's a, man, and I wish I could remember the name of the, the article that I read, but there's a professor in one of the New England universities. He teaches some sort of business innovative course. And so he actually makes it a requirement for his students where when they submit a writing assignment, 30% of their paper has to come from chat GPT. And then the other 70% is their own words. And his reasoning for it was if I'm encouraging, if I'm teaching an innovative classroom, but I encourage my students not to be innovative in the class. How am I really and truly encouraging their innovation for the business field? And so I, I'm very fascinated about this topic myself, but um, kudos to whoever brought it up. But I think it's just a combination and, and it could just very well be desperation. Um, some students, maybe they're just the whole time management thing. And so papers due at midnight, here it is 10 o'clock and I'm desperate because I have to make the, the grade in that class. And so they they lean on that that AI program and hope for the best. So yeah, uh, that makes sense. So would the that program discerning AI from human be an AI program? Do you know? That was my question to the presenter as well. Um, he said that it would be, but apparently there's some sort of algorithm, some sort of programming that they're working on to identify 
when the sentence structure sounds more like a computer than it does a human being. Um, I My technology skills are, are not that <laughs> advanced as those individuals, but um, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Um, there's a lot of things that I would like to know more about. I'm curious to see how it's gonna work when Turnitin can have that ability. Um, if you haven't created, and this is kind of off topic from what we're talking about today, but if you haven't created a chat GPT um, account, I would encourage you to go do it and enter in one of your own writing prompts. And it's amazing some of the stuff that comes up. Um, and you can, you know, after it gives you a whole entire page, it'll say, you know, do you want for me to continue generating information? And I was like, well, yeah, I, do, I would like to hear more. And it wrote, rewrote everything completely different, but the accurate information. So it's, it's a tool at the student's disposal and it's coming. It's, it's coming. Definitely pros and cons. Mm -hmm. um, does this seem to impact uh, young people more in particular? Young people in leadership roles who lead older folks with more experience, and I think they're referencing the imposter syndrome. Yeah, so um, I can speak from my own personal experience that I felt this whenever I moved into a department chair position um, about five years ago, because there were people that had, number one, been, in, been at the school longer than me, and um, number two, had been teaching way longer than I had. And so there was there were numerous times where I felt, man, I don't they got the wrong person. I, I don't know if I'm the right fit for this. Um, I'd had leadership positions um, in, in another industry in healthcare, but never in education. And it took a little bit of time for me to find my footing and to kind of build that confidence and that self-assurance like, okay, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm okay. I've got it. Um, I think that it is, it is something that people who are younger than the people they're leading may suffer with, but I don't, I don't have the data on that. So I can only speak from personal experience. That's fair. Um, Joe Ellen, are you referencing the document? Because I replaced that. Um, she's asking for the link that you shared in the beginning. Uh, was there? I I can't recall. No, I didn't. I didn't have a link. Okay. Um, the next question was: You mentioned the DSM and how it's not listed as a disorder. Can you explore this further? Perhaps this is because it's generally considered a normal response that most people experience at one point or another in various contexts. Perhaps it serves a function to an extent for people to succeed and push themselves further. Just a thought. I would agree. And so my background is in industrial organizational psychology, not clinical psychology. Um, I know that um, whenever anything goes into the DSM, there has to be copious amounts of data and research that has to be, you know, proven concept before they'll put anything in there. Um, so that could very well be why there's there's not anything in there. Um, there's also a lot of research out there on a term called emotional labor. And even though it's not in the DSM, it's still something that impacts people from a work environment perspective. So it could just very well be that there's not enough research out there and they don't want to publish it as being concrete or more concrete, similar or, you know, like they do the depression or bipolar disorder or whatever. And it could just be that they're waiting to get more data so that way they can they can put the information in the DSM more accurately than to make a snap judgment and, and put information out there that isn't that isn't accurate. But I, I think your your points are are very valid. It, maybe this is just something that we have to deal with. And so understanding that this is just how it is, it's just for a season in your life, this is not for the entirety of your life, and then helping our students kind of work through that season until they get past it, maybe that's just something that we as instructors are going to have to do. Definitely. There is a comment about how um, someone's experiencing imposter syndrome with regards to the, their tech abilities and not knowing if they're able to keep up with today's technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel um, that too. I feel yeah. that sometimes. <laughs> it's like, wait, my computer can do what? Okay. And the funny thing is about that, I had to go and ask one of my older faculty members um, because I, and, and trying to select a new laptop, I was like, okay, I, I have this, this option, this option, and this option, which one should I go with? Um, and this, this gentleman is in his, his, he's 20 years older than me, um, but he's, 
excellent when it comes to technology. So again, it's that whole seek support. I mean, I, I could sit there and stew and marinate in my own decisions and doing all sorts of research and this, that, and the other to try to make the right decision. Or I can just go ask my colleague right next door, hey, here are my three options. Which one, tell me what you know about each of them. And within a 15, 20 minute conversation, he was able to guide me on the right path. And I, you know, I made my decision at that point, so. Fair enough. Um, given your response to your scenario as a department chair, might this have actually quote unquote helped you to succeed and to learn more about becoming a better chair? Um, my, my ultimate passion is leadership. Um, I, I just, any aspect of it, I'm just, I, I just, I love it. I love it so much. Um, personally, I'm always trying to grow as a leader. Um, but I also want to be a good leader for my students too. And so again, having the, given the demographic of many of the students that come to our school, many of them not having anybody else in their family that they can help. And just in having conversations with students, it was something that I noticed was was reoccurring. And so just in, in looking up information, I came across this and then, you know, one Google search led to another. And before you know it, I, it was like this whole world that became available. And it just, for me, it helps me to have a different um, paradigm because it can be really easy to make assumptions. Um, but knowing this information helps me to kind of take a step back and ask questions about what may or may not be occurring with the student instead of just assuming that way I can more effectively help them. Um, and I, I find that I, I try to do that with um, those that I have to lead as well. Again, not perfect by any means. Um, <laughs> have a long way to go, but at least it's something that I'm I'm working towards. And for me, I think that's important. Definitely agreed. Is there a good way to survey students to detect this early in a semester to help them grow, help them develop a growth mindset? Maybe a survey or some sorts of diagnostic tool. I think they're referring to the DSM. Um, so, um there's some. Um, you might be able to ask them about like an internal versus external locus of control. And if you just Google that phrase, there's there's some not official official assessments, but there are some assessments that are out there that kind of give you a, a general idea. Um, I think having students understand the difference between those two, because if they really truly believe that everything is an external locus of control and it's all by luck and fate anyways, um, then that may not necessarily apply. But if you know that you have students that have that high internal locus of control, at least those can kind of, those students can kind of be on your radar. Um, okay, they believe that they control everything. So let me just make sure that I'm monitoring their behavior, monitoring, you know, our conversations and just making sure that they're not carrying too much of that weight on them. Um, more so than having them do a, an assessment on imposter syndrome, just have them look at internal versus external locus of control. That way you can at least drill it down to the students that might be more inclined for those perfectionists and control everything mentality than those other students. Okay. Um, it seems that not having a family member who went to college as a mentor slash guide is a key issue. Would a mentor or a success coach, maybe a fellow student help fill this role? Absolutely. Um, I think that our students are more comfortable talking to each other sometimes than they are coming to an instructor. And so if your school, I know that our school has a mentor program, but if your school can have that or support that, nurture that, really give it resources. Um, so that way students have a contact with another student that can be, that can be really helpful. Um, while the students might come from different backgrounds, at least having somebody that's in the thick of going to class and going to work and studying at the same time as the other student, they might, they might be more encouraging than anything. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for, for mentor programs. Definitely agreed. Do you have any closing remarks? No, I just, I again, I just wanna reiterate my point of thank you. Um, we only get so many heartbeats and I'm just, I'm really appreciative that you guys decided to spend an hour of those with me today. So again, don't be a stranger. If anybody needs anything or wanna carry on the conversation, send me an email. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. I'm happy to send you my slides. And um, just enjoy the rest of your week. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Um,
Uh, that looks like all the time we have for today. Thank you all for attending. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat right now for easy reference. And we will be emailing you a link of the recording of today's webinar once it becomes available, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.